Willow Tree School and how it became the Iowa Rural Schools Museum of Odebo. Presented for the Country School Association of America 2021 Conference by Sandra Kessler Host, curator of the Iowa Rural Schools Museum of Odebo, with docent narration by Christopher St. Clair. Iowa's unsung story is the transformation of the tall grass prairie into farms and one-room schools. In 30 years, between 1870 and 1900, Iowa executed its plan to settle the prairie by having experienced immigrant families develop farms out of the prairie. One part of the plan was the incentive to provide public education that would have easy access to school for all farm children. Iowa's system of one-room schools serving a four-square-mile area of 16 farmsteads was laid out with precision by survey maps. Willow Tree School was a representative school which later in 2013 became the Iowa Rural Schools Museum of Odebolt. My name is Sandy Host, and I'm pleased to give you a glimpse into my old country school that is now Iowa Rural Schools Museum of Odebo. Willow Tree School was built in 1883 by immigrant German farmers. The enclosed porch of the nearby Petersmeyer House was used as a temporary farm school from 1876 to 1882. This was before the one-room school was built on one acre with a lone willow tree on the northeast corner of Section 11 in Richland Township in Sac County. Willow Tree served the farm families of four sections, 1, 2, 11, and 12. In 1951, Willow Tree School was closed and then all the children went by bus to the Odebo Public School. I promised myself that someday I would research why it had closed. The old school continued to serve the community by becoming a 4-H clubhouse until 1959 when the school was sold to a previous teacher, Ruth Dannenberg Boney. The Bonies moved it to their farm a half mile away and used it as a hog farrowing building and painted it red like all their other farm buildings. In 2009, when I saw it, the school was not on a foundation and in pretty rough shape. Carol and Curtis Rash now owned the farm. Curtis, an old classmate of mine, got 40 interested people together that were focused on saving the old school. This group became known as the Rural Legacy Project. After his passing, Carol took his place as chair of the project. With her steady leadership, the project continued fulfilling its mission. Quote, we are devoted to preserving the history of Iowa's rural schools and instilling pride in the heritage of our community. Unquote. After an analysis by a historical architect and construction engineer, it was determined that the building could be moved and restored. After consulting with the Odebolt City Council, the Rural Legacy Project agreed to become a 501c3 for donations under the city's umbrella. In October 2011, a moving company owner whose great-grandfather had been the first farmer in Richland Township and had helped build the school, volunteered to move the school five miles to downtown Odebolt to what has become Heritage Square Park. The Rural Legacy Project decided to restore the school to be a safe structure that was insulated with cooling and heating system for temperature control of artifacts and that had a new foundation, floor, and lower walls. In addition, three layers of cedar shake roof with the original layer having arsenic dyed green shingles were removed and replaced by a green steel composition roof designed to look like cedar. The original tin roof ridges could not be placed on the new roof because of insurance requirements that no new holes be made in the roof. Natural cedar shingles have been outlawed in other states already to prevent fires and must be replaced often, whereas steel roofs should last a hundred years. 
Following a professional paint study, the school was restored to the original colors. Since our school's Victorian style was thought to be unique, I did a study by researching and photographing all the remaining maintained one-room schools in all of the 99 counties of Iowa. This was to see if Victorian schools were common since they were built at the peak of the Victorian era in the 1800s. It turned out about 30% had partial remaining Victorian features like our school had. Fish scales, gingerbread, fleur-de-lis tin roof ridges, two colors, green arsenic shingles, and tall Italianate windows. We found old green shades and ornate hooks in the entrance. More Victorian influence was noted in many additional furnishings that had been donated. All through the years, interior changes had not been made. Interior windows and wall trim, chalkboards and library cabinet were still in place. What we did find was that in 1920s, many schools were stripped of their Victorian features and painted all white. So the percent of Victorian style built schools could be higher. Even pump organs had their tops removed to look more modern. The biggest help in getting original items back into the school were from all the families whose relatives attended rural schools. Many Odie Bold and Sac County residents had stored such items in their attics, basements, and barns. Because the school was on our farm and generations of our family helped care for the school from the beginning, many of the original furnishings were stored on the farm. Later, my father lovingly moved these items to the basement of my grandparents' home in Odibold when my father and mother retired and moved there. We knew we had a lot of 1800s and 1900s items, so we wanted to show how the school items had evolved from 1883 to 1952. My wonderful mother agreed to be inundated by letting donated school items be dropped off at her house and garage which was just a few blocks from the museum. On moving day in 2013, Carol Youngren organized a line of farmers in pickup trucks with trailers to get items out of my mom's residence and move them to the school. The farmers not only moved items, but organized and completed any repairs or refinishing that was required. In 2013, Dr. William Fowler, sculptor, donated his bronze statue, Time for School, for the entrance to the museum. The Gronemeyer family, whose parents had been teachers in Odibo, donated a bronze statue titled Recess to enhance the outdoor classroom that was donated by many teachers. I have always loved history, especially Iowa's early rural history, and even studied under Dr. Joseph Walt at Simpson College, an expert on Iowa history. Researching rural schools and Iowa's rural history became my passion. I offered to be the curator of our museum and helped to organize a team of workers and figure out ways to display items that tells a big story yet has the original classroom remain. Doing extensive research, we divided the items into 12 major collections and created signage, a video to tell the big story, and 12 audio stations for visitors. I have been in many Iowa museums and have adopted many of their ideas on displaying items. We used the bottom of the corner library cabinet to display many student and teacher learning devices, two original pioneer cabinets handmade by the first farmers of Richland County display the toys and chores of the students. A laundry drying rack serves as a display for fabrics and fine sewing of farm women. A map rack serves to hold posters displaying numerous items. Period bookcases and cabinets display the oldest books and records of Willow Tree School. All displays are protected by carbonite plastic shields. In 2014, Preservation Iowa gave Willow Tree School the award for the best rural preservation in Iowa. 
In our research, we confirm that willow tree is representative of many of the 12,623 one-room schools in Iowa because they were all part of a rural school system developed and regulated by the state of Iowa. In 2018, Willow Tree was designated to be a CSAA landmark schoolhouse. We had so many artifacts from this school and similar schools in Iowa that we could organize and display them to tell the important but neglected story of Iowa's rural settlement and the role one-room schools played. Every county has a maintained rural school. Many have classrooms that are displayed as they were on a particular date in time. Others have been left as they were when the school was closed. In my travels across Iowa to see the 1800 rural schools, I found them similar, but no two were exactly alike in their structures. None of the original first-generation rural 1800 schools had electricity, plumbing, or basements. After 1870, the schools had three windows on opposite sides of the classroom until around 1910 when a theory was believed that no student should have light from opposite sides of the classroom. According to the theory, windows in a classroom should be on adjacent sides. Second generation schools built in the 1900s are easily distinguished by the windows and often had basements and chemical toilets. All schools are important to understand and remember the history of Iowa. Children already do reenactments of a day in a country school across Iowa. My vision is that understanding the rural schools of Iowa will bring more understanding of the values and respect for rural culture of the Midwest, especially with our city and coastal area visitors. We know we are very fortunate to have so many items to tell the broader story of Iowa's system of one-room schools. One question I am often asked is how big a role did religion play? In Iowa, there was a struggle over differences in beliefs between the Protestant and Roman Catholic branches of Christianity, but not disagreement on schools teaching basic Christian values. There was a tacit agreement that proselytizing stopped at the schoolhouse door. Although the Bible was used to teach reading in much earlier schools, by 1870, when Iowa's rural schools were built, McGuffey's eclectic readers had been around since 1836 with several revisions over the years. Many other primers and textbooks were available and used. The state of Iowa has never designated textbooks to use. It is still a local decision. Many rural teachers had sets of encyclopedias available to help set up classrooms, to access first aid knowledge, and to provide general information through the superintendent's office library and later in their own classrooms. The first popular set, published in Iowa in 1916, was the New Teacher and Pupils Cyclopedia set. The teachers were expected to be part of the community some even lived with families in school districts to be closer to the schools where they taught. Community meetings called lyceums were often held in the evening in rural schools. The children's desks would be pushed to one side of the room and parents would bring wooden folding chairs to sit on like they did at other community gatherings, such as school picnics, ice cream and box socials, harvesting events, and country church gatherings. Lyceums would often include articles read from the local newspaper, discussions of current news events, declamatory presentations, and social discourse in the form of debates among adults or graduating students. Listen to this short piece of a declamatory speech presentation of an eighth grader on temperance, which meant in the 1880s to control the use of alcohol. The words were written by Judge Reading of Chicago in a statement to a liquor dealer selling alcohol to a minor in 1886. You may let children visit your saloon, but the privilege of selling to children is denied to you. The father may say, 
Leave our son to us until the law gives you the right to destroy him. That will be soon enough for me, his mother, his sister, his friends, and his community to see him take the road to death. Give him to us in his childhood, at least a few hours of his youth, in which we can enjoy his innocence to repay us in some degree for the care and love we have lavished upon him. Like most other students, I have fond memories of my time in country school. Since moving back to Iowa in 2006, I have researched how Iowa's system of schools worked and why it closed. Iowa passed the Community School District Law of 1953 that allowed local decision on whether a country school would be closed. Farms were growing in size and families were having fewer children. This resulted in too few children living within a four square mile school district to support a one-room school. After World War II, buses were improved and could transport children safely and reliably to town schools. Most schools were closed in the 1950s by local decision. After 1966, no public one-room schools were operating in Iowa. Today, the Amish still continue to use one-room schools in Iowa. The history of Iowa's rural settlement and the 12,623 one-room schools produced the most literate population in the nation and deserves to be remembered. Let's step back in time and experience a one-room school. School would start with the ringing of the bell at 9 a.m. when children would line up at the door before the teacher gave permission to enter. A bell ringing also was used to tell them when it was the end of the morning and afternoon recesses and lunch. School would be out at 4 p.m. The children would all have morning and evening chores to do. Some children had ponies, but the majority of them walked to and from school. Now imagine you have walked to school. Please take a brief tour of our collection inside the schoolhouse and see why our museum is more than a vintage classroom. The grounds of the museum have been landscaped with common Iowa plants, such as lilies and hollyhocks. On the way to the front door is a life-sized bronze statue. Time for School by Dr. William Fowler. It depicts a girl on her way to school pulling on her brother's suspenders who is busy studying a frog. Fowler felt strongly that education not only happened in the classroom, but in nature as well. The children were modeled after his grandchildren, but the clothes reflect the late 1800s one-room school attire for young scholars, the word they used for students. Another life-sized bronze statue named Recess is located to the left of the museum and in front of an outdoor classroom. It depicts two boys joyfully playing on an early tire swing during recess. In the winter, morning routines required the teacher or an older student to start the fire in the coal stove an hour before school began. Depending on how well the school board supported the teacher, there was a smaller kerosene heater near the teacher's desk that could be used for an hour while the school warmed up. Many teachers would bring a gallon of kerosene that could be used one hour each morning for two weeks to heat the teacher's area. When students arrived, two students would be sent to fetch water at the nearest farm, often using a cream can with a lid and using a broom handle between them to carry the can. The water would be left in the can or placed in a crock. A zinc-lined dry sink had a hole in which wastewater would be collected in a container under the sink. Children used a common dipper until germ transmission was understood in the late 1880s. Then every family, and later every pupil, had their own cup. Jackets and hats were placed on hooks, lunch pails on shelves, and boots on the boot step. Teachers examined every student for cleanliness before allowing them to enter into the classroom, Remember, farm children had chore clothes and a nicer set of clothes for school and church. The smell of manure was never allowed in the classroom. Let's listen to how a day in country school would start after 1892. This oath of loyalty was written in 1892 by Ralph Bellamy as, I pledge allegiance to my flag and to the republic for which it stands, one nation indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. 
In 1942 it became, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. In 1954, under God was added, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The Pledge of Allegiance would usually be followed by singing. Listen to a past student describe Willow Tree School. Hello, my name is Kermit Seabrook. I went to this school for eight years starting in 1926. I passed the test that eighth graders had to take so they could go to school in Odebo. It took me two days. Town kids never had to take this test. I never thought that was quite fair. It looks different now than when I went to school here. Then it was painted all white outside and all blue on the inside, but the classroom hasn't changed. It's 24 by 24 feet with a 7 inch high platform in front of the room with the teacher's desk, recitation bench, and reading table for the little ones. The ceiling is 12 feet high with 9 hanging lights. We used kerosene lamps for light, not electric bulbs. The room had three windows on each side of the classroom. In 1883, all student desks were double wide to seat two or three students, like those on the right. By 1920, we had single desks, like the ones on the left, that were five different sizes, so our feet could touch the floor. To understand the farm culture, it is important to give attention to chores and toys of pupils. We are fortunate to have the Stallnacker family collection of toys from 1870 to 1950, in addition to many others. We have clay marbles from the 1800s and glass marbles from the 1900s. This is the size of 1800s softballs, and here is a 1900s ball. Marbles and softball were both popular. Children imitated their parents' work in their play. Boys liked to build things and girls took care of the family. Pocket knives were something that all males carried. In school, boys whittled pencil points for the girls. Knives were never considered weapons. They were tools for farm work. A group of farmers made a list of chores that were done by their grandparents, parents, and themselves, and the items that were required to do them. What were your chores and toys? Do they reflect what your grandparents or parents did? The right side of the classroom has the evolution of music from an 1800s pump organ to a record player, ending with a piano. No school had all of these at the same time. Every day started with music. It was important to parents because they wanted everyone to sing in church. Professor Charles Fullerton from Iowa State Teachers College, now UNI, became world famous for his methods of teaching music using records played on wind-up phonographs. This method did not require teachers to be good singers or organ or piano players. He believed children must hear good reproductions of music to learn to sing properly. There are many informative posters with former students, awards, school records, plat books and maps displayed, artifacts and teaching skills and different teaching methods such as recitation, memorization, mnemonics, lexicology, theme integration, declamation, social debate, use of awards and having older students helping younger children, are on the walls. Iowa had a standard course of study starting in 1890. That is why children could move through the course of study at the rate at which they learned the material. Most importantly, teachers divided scholars into beginning, intermediate, and advanced levels for each branch, which is what they called subjects. They then rotated by groups every 10 to 15 minutes to a bench in front of the class where scholars recited their lessons to the teacher. Pupils could move up in the groups only after passing a test for each level. Teachers were known for using their willow or hickory sticks for discipline and maintaining quiet classrooms. Of course, the threat of telling parents of misbehavior was like asking for a spanking from your dad and always meant more chores to be done. Everyone knew what a final disciplinary action was. It was having a public spanking by the superintendent that not only affected the scholar but embarrassed his whole family. Until the 1900s, an 8th grade education was considered enough for rural children. 
However, by the 1920s, high school graduation was expected. An eighth grade exam that was certified by the county superintendent of schools was required for every rural student to enter high school. Town students were never required to take this test. After the Iowa Basic Skills Test tracked individual student learning, the exam was still required, even though it showed rural students were generally ahead of town students academically. The evolution of writing was extremely important at this time for communication and learning. In 1896, free federally funded rural mail delivery began. This meant rural families could get letters, catalogs, magazines, and reading materials at their farm homes for the first time. Before rural delivery, they had to travel or pay a representative to retrieve mail from a district post office. The rural school system and the free rural mail delivery created a revolution in writing. Cost of paper used for writing and printing was much less expensive with mass production. Technology evolved from feathers to dipping pens, chalk with slates to slate composition books and slate pencils, parchment to paper to pencils and pens, inkwell to ink bottles. There was more paper for tablets, composition books, and workbooks. Most importantly, materials for teaching the Palmer and other methods to establish a more readable and uniform cursive writing. The museum also has a research library and a large collection of smaller 1800s and larger 1900s textbooks. A collection of maps, atlases, and globes shows that farmers considered geography very important for children to be taught in schools since it could not be taught at home without these items. There's an excellent student reading library with both 1800s and 1900s books. There are large collections of teaching aids and charming and interesting student scrapbooks. All schools were encouraged by 1920 to have at least 100 reading books in their library. In addition, we have a fabric and fine sewing collection that reflects the work of farm women. There's a whole story on how Victorian clothes made social statements about boys becoming men and girls becoming women. Male babies wore dresses and were under the parental direction of their mothers. When they entered boyhood and before they started school, a breeching ceremony occurred. The young boy would exchange dresses for breeches, also known as knickers, which were short pants that ended tightly below the knee. Wearing knickers was a sign of boyhood and that the father was now in charge of his son's upbringing. A second ceremony occurred when a boy reached manhood. He would change to wearing long pants. Girls wore short dresses with stockings. When girls were considered to be women, they wore long skirts and sleeves and high necklines that did not allow skin to show below their necks except for hands. All females wore long pinafores to cover their dresses to prevent soiling. After World War I in the 1920s, female styles dramatically changed to shorter hemlines and lower necklines, but farm women and girls continued to be practical and wore aprons to protect their dresses while working at home. We invite you to come for a visit to the museum and see and hear for yourselves. Another way to see photos and to get more information is to purchase one of our books today for $25. Iowa History of the One Room School has hundreds of colored photos of items, stories related to the 12 collections, and an educational history of Iowa's 12,623 one room schools. Another book, Iowa Historic Schools, Highlighting the Victorian Influence is also available for $25. It has photos of all the maintained schools in Iowa today and explains the structures of Iowa's system of schools. Hope you have enjoyed this presentation. Please come to the 21st Annual Iowa Country School Preservation Conference in Sac County. After being postponed a year, it will be held at Odebolt, Iowa on October 8th and 9th, 2021. See registration forms on preservationiowa.org or email carolrash at ruralschoolsiowa at gmail.com.